Mini episode 551 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.info. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Welcome to mini episode 551 of the FDH Lounge. This is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris here with the latest installment of our tradition of reviewing our greatest guest moments on the program. In this case, from mini episodes 451 to 550. Well, this is the show where nothing is off topic. For the first time, one of our best of shows has something of a common thread running through it. Right after we last assembled one of these shows... I had a chance to interview Jimmy Jamison and his fellow Survivor bandmates backstage before a performance in Cleveland. Jimmy had been a multiple-time guest previously on the program and was one of our all-time favorites. Only about two weeks after this conversation, my first ever with him in person, he suddenly and shockingly passed away. So subsequent conversations about him with his close friends and fellow bandmates Bobby Kimball and Jim Peterick are also a part of this compilation as well as our final clip here, a touching statement about the support of Jimmy's fans and friends from his daughter, fellow musician Amy Jamison. We dedicate this best of show to a kind and generous friend of the show and one great musician, Jimmy Jamison. God bless Jimmy. Rest in paradise. Was it kind of an immediate thing? You kind of fall back into it, kind of like falling off a bicycle, or uh, did it really kind of take a couple of shows to kind of get the rhythm going again? Yeah, it was like falling off a bicycle. I was never okay. Yeah, that's a good one. That's okay, it was. so it was, it was immediate. It was pretty quick? Yeah, it was pretty yeah. first rehearsal thing. It was great. Sounded, really? Yeah. It sounded great. It was like, wow, this is yeah. really cool to be yeah. doing this again. No kidding. Right yeah. off the bat then. Wow. Yeah, I, I, would, I was singing Dave's songs for a while, and then Dave came in and started singing his own songs, and Dave was singing them. I said, well, God, now what am I going to do? I can't sing Dave's songs. <laughs> I saw a great column on your blog about the, the subject of uh, maybe the next the best guy to take the torch is the best player in the NBA, good old unibrow uh, Anthony Davis, and uh, a comparison of him to uh, Tim Duncan, which is interesting because our FDH director of research, Nate Noy, when he was at Kentucky, uh, compared him to Hakeem Olajuwon, said that you know everybody says that he's really raw right now, but I see the potential, and I've always given him credit for seeing the potential to develop beyond what he was. Because let's, let's face it, nobody was saying that about Nerland's Noel a year later. They were just saying he was a Patrick putback guy. And uh, Anthony Davis has transcended that, clearly. But, uh, again, for, for me as a lifelong uh, Clevelander and Cavs fan, I'm in no hurry for LeBron James to pass the torch. But uh, we always thought that when it happens, if it happens, well, it, it will. It happens to everybody. We always thought Kevin Durant would be the next guy. But, being down there and, and, and seeing the teams in the Western Conference and specifically there in New Orleans, is there a chance Anthony Davis just leapfrogs everybody and becomes the next uh, uh, great player in the NBA, the best one? I, I really think there is. And, and let me tell you, I wrote that comparison the day that Anthony, that the Pelicans and AD were playing the Spurs, Tim Duncan. I think there are a lot of different players. I've seen so many comparisons of him to various greats. Uh, and the thing that's so different about him, Rick, is this was a guy, you, you know, most, most stars are identified early now. You know, they're, they're told from 9 or 10, they're found in the AAU camps, and they're, they're told they're going to be great. And this kid totally flew under the radar screen because he was short. He was 6 feet. He was a point guard. So he, mm-hmm. he really developed his skills to run the floor, to handle the ball, um, and he, he was hungry. He, he, he didn't get all of that attention. And then, miraculously, he hits this growth spurt, and all of a sudden, everybody's like, who, who, who is this person? Where has he been for the past five, six years? So I think his skill set is so unique and different. And, and I think the way he came up and grew up, um, not to say that there aren't other hungry players. I, I don't mean to, to imply that at all. But I think his hunger is, is a different type. You know, his parents. Um, great people, hardworking, blue-collar Chicago parents who sent their kids to a charter school. Um, it was nothing fancy, that's for sure. He didn't have the bells and whistles, and he stayed so grounded through this whole process. 
and his parents go so many places with him. Uh, when he was traveling for Team USA over uh, in Europe competing this summer, his parents were there. He's just such a great person off the court as well as on the court. And, and I think those different unique skills and different unique experiences uh, make him hard to put into one little box and, and make him interesting to watch. Your good friend and fellow bandmate, uh, Jimmy Jameson. We'd had him on the program a couple times. I had just gotten to meet him in person about two weeks before. Uh, unfortunately, he collapsed. So uh, I'm sure over the period of time, the last couple of months, I'm sure you've been involved in uh, making tribute statements uh, and, and the like and reflecting publicly on uh, your time with him. So just like to get your thoughts on that and what Jimmy meant to you personally and professionally. Yeah, sure. I, it was just a, a huge tragedy, a huge loss. And, you know, when certain people pass away, you have some kind of warning. I, you know, nobody, this one, nobody saw coming. At least I sure didn't. Um, and, uh, you know, when I, when I got the news, I, I just thought it was impossible. You know, it didn't sink in uh, that this wonderful, vital person that still had so much to give uh, to the music world it was gone, and you know, I kept rewinding it in my head, and I couldn't wrap my head around it. Uh, and uh, I'm still, you know, still grappling with it. But my way of of grieving, Rick, is um, is maybe the best way I can do it, and that's really to write music uh, in memory of it. And uh, a few weeks after uh, Jimmy passed, um, I I just started writing a song, and it was called "Heaven Passes the Torch." And it, and it's it's really it was not only about Jimmy but it was also in memory of Fergie Fredrickson who died the same year uh, ironically two of the greatest melodic rock singers you know we've known and uh, all of a sudden you know that's my way of grieving and it, it started taking shape and the song took shape and uh, I put it together and uh, at at the church service not not the original church service in the family but. A few weeks later uh, in Memphis, there was a, a very large church service at a very large church, and I got to, uh, they cut a video, they meaning uh, the, the people that were putting on the the event, uh, put on, a, a, created a video to Heaven Passes the Torch with, with images of Jimmy through the years, and it was on the big screen, and the whole church just was like in tears. Uh, and that was the first real thing I did, you know, in Jimmy's memory. Uh, a few weeks later, it was in um, Memphis again, of course, Jimmy's hometown at the Hard Rock Cafe. And, and this time it was an outpouring of so many of the rock community. You know, we had, you know, Matt Ranger and, and David Pack and, and Leonard Skinner and, and uh, yours truly. And I, I can't even begin to, to name all the groups. And, of course, some of the groups that Jimmy – cut his teeth with members of Target, members of Cobra. Uh, and even before that, you know, the debuts when Jimmy was nothing more than 17 years old, all paying their tribute, you know, and uh, that was the day that I was able to reconnect for the first time with Mark Jubé, the original drummer of, of Survivor. Well, actually the second drummer, but the one that we had the majority of success with. And he came bursting into the uh, the green room and I couldn't believe it. I was like, seen someone I hadn't seen since 1986 and we hugged and he said I just read your book and I loved it and it was just a, a great moment but it was almost as if Jimmy brought us together again at, at the top of the food chain with MLB.com and really anything else MLB associated would be uh, this new commissioner of baseball a little bit of almost papal politics here uh, as far as when the uh, the white smoke was going to come out and uh, how this was going to be uh, decided with uh, baseball's version of the College of Cardinals, but uh, it, it, the guy who was thought to be the front runner all along did emerge with the job. What was your sense of the thought process uh, by the owners as they were weighing uh, possibly deviating away from uh, the Bud Selig direction and eventually cementing it in the end? Well, my first thought is that uh, I, I started covering the Orioles in 1984, and Bud Selig was an every ever present presence every night uh, that I was at County Stadium and I, I've known him and gotten close to him so to, to imagine a game without him it's pretty hard I remember Lou Wolf sent him an email that said you will not retire until I expire and the game has grown and been transformed in so many ways 
And I think what baseball decided was a logical thing is that this guy who has done so much for us, this guy, Rob Manfred, has been his right-hand guy. He did the labor deals. He did the drug deals. He has been basically in on almost every important decision. And I couldn't really, I had trouble comprehending that anybody else would get the job. I think the support for him was overwhelming. Yeah, and in the end, uh, that's what ended up happening because uh, the other candidates could not uh, sufficiently coalesce and uh, provide a uh, a winning alternative. That's a healthy thing, that you get Mm -hmm. in there and Rob got grilled by a couple of owners. Are you going to be this? Are you going to be that? Because the game, there's work to do, you know, and, and I mean, there, there's an obsession with with the pace of game. There, I mean, there are many things, international marketing and uh, a continuing expansion of social media and, and all of that. I mean, the, the game has to continue to innovate. So for owners to, to be able to quiz him and say, what's your plan and all that, I think that was a good thing, and that was a healthy thing. But I think when they came out of the room, I think they felt they felt that they that the guy the right guy had gotten the job, and and I think they knew also that that guy probably had to come within the four walls of baseball. That I I, I never thought it worked with a commissioner from outside baseball. He grew to dislike the owners and the players almost equally. He couldn't. He was some of the owners. Some of the commissioners I've known were put off by the idea of players and owners fighting over this big pile of cash. But Selig spoke the language of, a, of an owner, and he got the he 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 dictated that the owners speak with one voice in labor negotiations, and that had never happened before. And you know, there's a whole generation of fans now that don't know that between 1975 and 1995. The owners and players did their dangest to try to kill the game every three to five years. So th- this is a continuation of what's working. It was uh, a very, very unique project that brought you guys together both personally and professionally. I know you'd been longtime friends prior to that, but uh, in 2011, that great Kimball Jameson album that you guys put out and uh, doing the duets, uh, talk about the story behind that and what it was like to work with them on that kind of level. Well, uh, First, Rick, I have to tell you that Jimmy and I were best friends for over 25 years. Wow. And uh, anyhow, I, I, I sang on several CDs with him. Uh, you know, we, we, loved, we loved writing music together. We loved, uh, you know, I was doing background vocals on his CDs, and, and we would go and sing on someone else's uh, record. But Frontiers Records gave us a call. And um, and sent us an email. They wanted to know if, if we would be interested in doing something together. And I thought, Man, absolutely, you know. And Jimmy wanted to do it too. So uh, several writers, um, several writers were. They had about twenty songs they sent us, and um, we chose the twelve songs that we wanted to do. And um, uh, this. This guy from Germany uh, recorded the tracks that we chose and sent them to here in L.A. And uh, Jimmy came out and we went into a friend's studio who was a guitar player of uh, Tower of Power for several years. And um, his name is Carmen Grillo. And and, uh, Carmen engineered uh, and, and sort of produced the lead vocals that Jimmy and I did. And the album came out. And it was called Kimball Jameson. And um, then Jimmy and I started touring uh, all over Europe uh, doing those songs. Vince wasn't forced to give us the full loaf like he did a year ago, giving Daniel Bryan the win. But as far as Roman Reigns not getting the win, I mean, the fans got at least half a loaf this year. It's Seth Rollins. Clearly, Vince is able to justify this in terms of, okay, we're building our next Triple H. We're building our next franchise heel for the next 10 to 15 years. He can justify it that way, but the investment in Brock Lesnar was all about building him up for Roman Reigns to be the guy to take him down in that moment. I mean, there's not any doubt in your mind, is there, that Vince backed down due to the circumstances that were created? Well, I, you know, I think it may be the case, but let me throw this at you. All right, so Brock mm-hmm. Lesnar gets this victory over The Undertaker last year, and I remember talking to you about it. We are all stunned. We are all like, oh, my God, I can't believe they gave it to Lesnar. <laughs> and then I started to see the genius in it, saying, okay, now they're going to put the belt on him. He's a special attraction. 
He's going to beat whoever he faces, even though I think he had like literally two title defenses after he won the title. But who cares? The guy is still champion yep. for a long time. And I think, yeah, the plan was to put somebody over, and that guy was Roman Reigns. But let me ask you this. Maybe when they had this all scripted out, they didn't think Brock was going to resign. Maybe they had this scripted out as this is Brock. He's going to be done. They knew when his contract ran out. It's not like it was a surprise that it was going to run out right after WrestleMania. And, yeah, he'd put somebody over, and that would be it. Now they realize this Lesnar thing is kind of working. You know, people really like him. He's popular. We want to bring him back. You know, we want to make a push to re-sign the guy. And they do. Now they've re-signed the guy. Now think about it. You've got this monster, Brock Lesnar, that you've booked to beat The Undertaker, destroy John Cena, and be a champion for a year. But you don't necessarily want him to be a part-time champion anymore. Maybe the change of plans wasn't necessarily Roman Reigns isn't ready, but the change of plans was we want to keep Brock Lesnar strong. We want to keep him as the guy. We've got him signed for another few more years. We're going to use him sparingly, but we don't want him to lose clean. Because, yeah, I thought like you thought, sure, the plan was for Roman Reigns to do a few Super Bowl, Superman punches, become the champion, and that's it, and Brock's gone. But now that Brock isn't gone, maybe the reason there was a change of plans was they don't want Brock Lesnar losing. And he didn't lose, you know. So now whenever he comes back, probably at SummerSlam and probably as a face because everybody loves the guy, Brock Lesnar never lost the title. So you may be right, but maybe the reason this whole thing changed was because of Brock Lesnar being a part of this company moving forward. John, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but in terms of what happens uh, Sunday night and Monday night, is that to me the MTV Music Awards at this point, again, it's a cliche to bemoan the fact that MTV doesn't actually play music anymore, but they're like <laughs> all cliches, it's true. You know, it's, to me it's almost a substance-free kind of a deal. It's a pop culture extravaganza. Monday night yeah. with the Emmys, you have actual tangible achievements and the recognition of those at stake as well as being a pop culture thing. Would, would you agree with the characterization of those two nights? I definitely think so. I think um, I, it's almost like the um, the analogy of I always say that the uh, the MTV VMAs is a lot of sizzle and limited steak, whereas the Emmys is more steak uh, and a little bit less sizzle. Um, you know, there's a lot more substance going on. I mean, I, just in awards. I mean, how many awards do they give out at the VMAs? I, I mean, I counted like seven or eight of them. Um, I mean, there were only like. Uh, I mean, off the top of my head, there's like best female video, best male video, best pop video, uh, best rock video, artist to watch, the Vanguard Award. It's a lot of performances and a lot of, um, you know, shtick back and forth, whereas the Emmys is very, very chock full of different awards. Tell us the story, please, of uh, what went into sure. this project, some of the obstacles involved, and how it came to be. Well, to go back to the, to the, the roots of how this book came to be, it really... Um, started when I was doing preparation to get back together with Journey in, two, in 1996 when we got back together after an 11-year hiatus to do the album called Trial by Fire. And, and I grew up more, you know, more or less a jazz drummer in my early years growing up in Boston I was a big band fan, and then I went into uh, loving all the fusion groups that were developing in the early 70s when I graduated from high school in 72. Went to Berkeley and Berkeley College of Music in Boston, and by the time um, I started touring professionally with Jean-Luc Ponty, that was the beginning of me playing in a bit more of a rock style. It was jazz fusion, and Eventually, the guys in Journey heard me and had me play in the bands. So when I played in Journey in those early years, my concept of rock drumming was very much just, I would call, like an organic approach based on years of listening to Cream and Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin. But unlike jazz, I had never really studied rock drumming and studied where it came from. When I played jazz and studied jazz, I studied the whole history of jazz drumming, which is an important part of learning how to play jazz. But I realized right before we did that get-together, Trial by Fire, that I wanted to do a serious study of the roots of rock drumming myself. So it was my own personal project that I just read lots of books uh, Sounds of the City 
for instance, you know, like a book on the history of rock. I read dozens of books and then bought uh, probably hundreds of CDs so I could really be more of a, let's say, a edu- an educated expert on, on rock drumming walking into that journey reunion. And it was a lot of fun and it was helpful to do that. And, I, of course, I really studied the the singing and the you know the music of Sam Cooke because that's Steve Perry's number one influence and Jackie Wilson probably his number two influence and and then all the great blues guitarists that uh, Neil grew up listening to and you know I was I had a lot to go on as far as who I knew their influences were and then I just kept going with that. And I find it fascinating what I started to learn. And basically, at the end of the day, what I found out is most of the early so-called rock drummers, like DJ Fontana, who played with Elvis, or Earl Palmer, who played with Little Richard, they were all a lot like me. They just grew up playing jazz, but they were offered studio work because they were the most professional drummers in town. And they played on many of these groundbreaking early rock records uh, from the early 50s, the mid 50s, and the late 50s, and and then into the early 60s. So that when you know, so I did the reunion with Journey. We had a, a great time. I you know I was able to contribute some parts to the music that made to me made even more sense than what I played before because I had such a such a a better command over the roots of rock drumming myself. And then in 2002, I was doing an educational video for Hudson Music, um, largely based on what I learned. I called that video the history of the U.S. beat, where I really trace the whole history of drumming and, and where it came from, jazz, and then how it evolved into rock and then jazz rock fusion. And so I presented the people from Hudson Music the idea of why don't we go around the country and even to England and then interview these uh, these drummers because many of them are quite old and you know and not going to be around forever and, and hear their story you know hear how, what it was like for them to record with Little Richard or Elvis or Buddy Holly and and the focus isn't the whole history of rock drumming it's really the early years like we call it the roots of rock drumming basically starting in the late 40s, early 50s, and taking us up to about 1965 when the Beatles and the Stones came on because most people really know a lot about rock drumming after that, but it's before that's mysterious because there really weren't many credits on the records. They didn't. A lot of people didn't realize who these session musicians were that played on the Chuck Berry records and, uh, the you know, all, the, the, all these kind of, early blues records and early rockabilly albums. So I I traced out a lot of these guys. We went with the camera crew and filmed quite a few interviews. So it was a great project and, and great to meet all these drummers. And, and I did interview quite a few of them. And then uh, the other guys got involved and started doing their interviews. And, and basically, like you mentioned, it, it did sit on the shelves for about... 10 years after like 2002, 2003, because we wanted to make it into a movie, but the licensing fees involved to license songs and videos of Elvis and Buddy Holly and Little Richard, et cetera, people like that, was just astronomical and we couldn't afford it. So it wasn't until we came up with the idea to have the interviews transcribed, but then we needed a good editor. I didn't have time to edit the whole thing, but we met Daniel Glass, was a very good drummer himself. He's in the Royal Crown Review. He, uh, he was playing with um, Brian Setzer and really an expert on this kind of early history. He's written a number of books himself. So he very ably did the lion's share of the editing. And then I would edit his editing and, you know, we would do fact checking. And so that's that's really the evolution of how the whole thing came to be. And it really wasn't until we met Daniel Glass that we could come up with the completed project, he had the time and the energy and the expertise to really bring these transcribed interviews to a readable place. Talk about that a little bit, because it would have been a special moment regardless for you, but there was a little bit of extra oomph to it, a little bit of extra 
motivation, certainly, and uh, proving yourself to the Detroit Lions in that scenario had to just take that moment right to the stratosphere, I would think. Well, I'll tell you what, it, 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 the, the story in itself in a whole, uh, and I've said this so many times, Rick, and I think you've heard me say this before, and that is, you know, Steven Spielberg could not have written my script in regards to everything that transpired in my life uh, from age five until that time that I received that punt from uh, – uh, Mr. Montgomery, Greg Montgomery, but uh, stemming back to what you alluded to in regards to being part of the Detroit Lions, yes, it, it was a it was a it was a tough time. It really was because, you know, a lot, what what people did not realize behind the scenes, as far as me personally, was that I was fighting tooth and nail to keep my family together. You know, I was I was really fighting hard to keep a job. You know, it wasn't just a long life dream for me to play professional football. It turned into something that I had actually had to do. That's the reason why the name of the book was so fitting. The next level, of a game that I had to play. It was, it was just out of that. It, I had to play that game, and I felt like there were some situations over in Detroit where they were interfering with that in regards to me keeping my family together, and, and that's what made it personal to me. You know, I just felt like there were some things going on that, uh, you know, I'm my own worst critic. Uh, I think that I'm extremely hard on myself. And uh, if someone beats me outright in something, I'll go over to that individual's hand and I'll shake it. And I'll say, great job. You're a better man than I am. But when I, when I truly is obvious that I win a job and I still get cut, it's, uh, that doesn't sit right. It never sat right with me. And... Um, I felt like I was just pop, hopped around and popped around like a pinball, like a, like a ping pong ball over there. Just you know, whenever Mr. Fonts wanted uh, a good relief for Mel Gray, um, he called me. And the second that Mel Gray got healthy, there were some other guys that they could have relieved relieved them, but he always chose me to get rid of. And I took that personal. So when they released me that last time. And I say within the time that they released me, I'm talking about within maybe uh, four hours, three to four hours, uh, I was picked up by the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And the thing of it is is that Tampa saw me play. We were in their conference. We played them twice a year. So they knew exactly what they were getting. And I think they had a, they knew exactly the extra punch they were getting because they knew what I went through over there. So, uh they they knew exactly what they were getting when they when they signed me and and li- up, everything leading up to that moment to October second, nineteen ninety four. You know I've heard it and heard it and heard it over and over and over again, Rick, in regards to, oh yeah, VT, you're going to be the first guy ever to do it and this and that, whatever, whatever. And, and I, it almost got to a point to where I really got sick of it. I really did because I I refused to add that pressure to me. I just wanted to keep a job to keep my family together. That's all I was really focusing on. But then, you know, with the compound of the events that occurred in Detroit, that just that just amplified it and magnified it. And by the time I got to game time, I mean, it was something that I can't – it's really tough to describe because I was always a different type of person on game day anyway. I turned into like a mean – like a little James Cagney. I was a mean, a mean cuss. I really was. I was like – the coaches and the players, whoever knew me, knew not to talk to me during game day because I, I really turned evil. I didn't like anybody, not my own teammates, no one. And I, ha- and I got in that state, and, and I got in this mini rage inside. So when I stepped on the field on that day, um, I, knew one, I knew something was going to happen because I had no intentions on fair catching not one punt that day. Either I was going to get blown up, fumble, and they released me the next day, or I was going to do something special because I already had in my mind that I had no intentions on fair catching the ball. Now, my odds were with me because I knew the type of punter that I was going up against. Greg Montgomery is a guy that outkicked his coverage. He kicked it long and deep, which gave me an opportunity to sit underneath the ball and get myself in position to catch. So I was already, the odds were were with me. It was just a matter of if I got the right blocks. And you know what? Uh, all those guys, I can, I, I, can, I can see it as clear as day. You know, all the blocks that came before me, 
You know, people said that I I showboated before I even hit before I left the twenty yard line by sh- by by high stepping before and after. But I wasn't showboating, man. I was setting up my blocks at the start, and if anyone who saw it, they saw that those guys were just falling down like dominoes. And Mazio Royster got on to Greg Montgomery and blasted him, and that's what freed me up. And again, it wasn't me, man. It was those blocks. If you saw those blocks on film, they they were they were brutal. They were awesome. So I I, I trust me. I went to every one of my teammates and I thanked them and I and I gave them a hug, man, because. If it weren't for them, I wouldn't have been in that end zone, you know? Sounds like you've really gotten some excellent commitments from people thus far. Obviously, that really speaks to the level of love and respect that everyone had for your father. It does. It is amazing, the outpouring of love and friends and uh, people who have contacted me that I've never even even met. And just the outpouring of love from musicians and, and, and friends and fans. And he loved them all. Uh, he did. He, he loved every one of them and just had such a big heart. And obviously he did because they're just coming out of the woodwork just to just volunteer. And it's just it brings me to my knees, just the outpouring of love from everybody. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, all clear channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio. Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QBC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse, and The Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements.